Hello, everyone. Russ of Aquarimax Pets here with Alex from Tarantula Haven. Welcome, Alex. Hey, how you doing, Russ? Doing well. How about you? Pretty good. I'm doing all right. Yep, we've been looking forward to having you on the channel for a long time. So uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Us. Yeah. And I just uh, want to give you a second to introduce yourself for those of you who haven't uh, seen your channel yet. So go ahead and just uh, let us know what you're doing, what your channel's about, that kind of thing. Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Alex, and I run Tarantula Haven, and my channel is pretty much about tarantulas, but I do have some other animals that I keep. Um, I've kind of streamlined everything as much as possible down to tarantulas, but I do keep some isopods and uh, a few scorpions. I did have some praying mantises, but um, I kind of gave those to my son because they were a little bit too much work for me. Yeah, compared to yeah, mantis for an invertebrate, it's kind of a lot of work. That's true. Oh, well, we've got a lot of people in the chat today. I see Wally from Supreme Gecko, Young Lad, Frank the Tank, the Bug Hub, Javi Strange Pets, Memories of Violet, um, Vicabulous, Mike Shepard, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. Wow, we got a we got a good group already. Mantis God is here. Planeta Aquario. Cool. So one question that people ask me all the time, Alex, and I don't feel qualified to answer it because I unfortunately don't keep any tarantulas. Uh, what is it okay to keep isopods with tarantulas? And if so, what kind? Well, um, I started keeping some isopods with some of my um, moisture dependent species. Um, and I, I pretty much limited to dwarf whites uh, just as a cleanup crew. But since I've done it, um, I mentioned to you, it was like right after I had started doing that, Tom Moran had put out something about um, keeping isopods with some of his invertebrates and how he seemed to have had some few, a few losses with, uh, I think some scorpions. And it was, you know, I was kind of worried that I had done the wrong thing because I was trying it out. And I haven't seemed to have had any issues. Um, the tarantulas have been living just fine with the isopods in there and they don't seem to bother them. And I, I was mostly worried during molting, you know, where they would be most vulnerable if there would be an issue, but not with the dwarf whites. But I would, I do tend to stay away from any of the larger species. Mm -hmm. And just simply because I've seen how voracious they can be, and I kind of worry that they would possibly overtake a tarantula or anything else that might be in a vulnerable state. Yeah, that makes sense. We just got a, a super chat from Tarantula Cat. Welcome, Tarantula hey, Cat. Hey, Tarantula Cat. How you doing? <laughs> Showing to some support here. We appreciate that. Thank you so much, Tarantula Cat, for joining. If you haven't yep. seen the live stream that we did a few weeks ago with Tarantula Cat, everybody check it out. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'll have to go back and, and watch that because I'd missed that one. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Yeah. And Maybe. I see Memories of Violet. <laughs> how yep. you doing? Memories oh, Bug Violet. Hub, how you doing too? Yeah, I've got a lot of folks here. This is great. Yeah. There's Sean Meister, LGB Exotics. Awesome. So uh, how long have you kept Dwarf Whites with Tarantulas? Uh, a little bit over a year, I would say, probably maybe a year and a half is when I've, I've how long I've been doing it. Yeah. Okay. And when you, uh, how many enclosures would you say approximately you have dwarf whites in? Um, just quick count here. I would probably say about ten of them, somewhere around there. Hey, Tarantula Cribs. <laughs> hey, tarantula Cribs with a super sticker. Thanks for coming in and thanks for the support. Really appreciate it. Sometime, Tarantula Cribs, if you ever want to, I'd love to have you on a stream. That'd be awesome, too. <laughs> so, um, so you've tried it in quite a number of enclosures, and it's not just an isolated thing. It's it's a decent number of enclosures without any issues. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's good to see. Um, it's always difficult, and we were kind of talking about this a little bit before the stream. You get people in the tarantula hobby, which I admire from, you know, from outside because I'm, my wife doesn't want me to keep tarantulas, but I think they're awesome. 
Um, anyway, uh, you see different people in the tarantula hobby, some saying, you know, dwarf whites are fine with uh, tarantulas. I haven't had a problem. You have other people say, I would never keep isopods with my tarantulas. And um, you have people in the middle, you know, and some people probably keep a variety of species of isopods with their tarantulas rather than limiting themselves to one species. Um, it's really interesting to see how how that goes. Um, just to, to point out an interesting thing, people have asked me kind of a parallel to that. People have asked me if I recommend keeping uh, isopods with millipedes. And I say no, because millipedes go through a very vulnerable uh, molting stage, much like tarantulas, although tarantulas have a little bit of protection because they use like the silken mat. And sometimes, as you mentioned uh, earlier before the stream, they have the urticating hairs in the mat, and sometimes not so much. And I guess it would depend on species because not all species have urticating hairs anyway. Right. So um, they have some protection, but millipedes, basically they burrow and they molt, or sometimes they don't even burrow and they molt. And so isopods encountering something like that, it could be a problem. But then I talked to Kyle of Roach Crossing and he said, well, I raised uh, the, the, what is it called? The um, Chintrobolus splendidus, the fire red millipedes with yes. Corselio scaber, which are considered a protein hungry isopod. He raises them in droves together. They're in huge densities. He just makes sure they always have plenty of food and he, they're just breeding like crazy. Both of them, no problems. So I think uh, it is possible to say, you know, as a general rule, this is probably a good idea uh, for certain things, but it's also possible to find ways to, you know, situations that can work. Uh, maybe a blanket policy saying you should never keep isopods with tarantulas is a little bit too much. And um, maybe any isopod with any tarantula is also a bit too much on the other end. But you seem to have found a happy medium. You found a species that works for you without any problems. So what just I, I thought that was an interesting parallel yeah and um i've also heard you know that they really don't provide much of a benefit because tarantulas mm -hmm. have a tendency to not produce that much waste um you know mm -hmm. uh, i i keep crested geckos or i used to i have one left but um crested geckos are messy they make a lot of poo <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh you know they definitely benefit from having some kind of uh, ice pod in there, cleanup crew, but um, tarantulas, of course, they, most of their stuff goes on the wall <laughs> and the glass, um, but they do produce the boluses, you know, they, they leave those behind and you can't always get to them, you know, in, in a timely manner, especially when you're dealing with a lot of tarantulas. So uh, it does kind of help out with that. And those things will tend to, you know, and, and a moisture dependent uh, enclosure, you tend to get a lot of fungus with that and you even of course attract bites and so on. So that, that is a big helper as far as, you know, with tarantulas are concerned. And of course the drier species, you don't really keep them in there, but those have a tendency not to have an issue with those uh, types of things anyway. Right. Right. Because things like mites and mold are limited by moisture anyway. So that makes sense. Cool. Mm -hmm. Hey, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the super chat, Richard, from the Collective. Cooler than the other side of the pillow. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that phrase. I don't think I've ever heard that, but that, I love it. That's awesome. Thank you again for the support. I'm glad to see Richard. Richard, I, I was we were texting earlier today on Instagram, and he mentioned he was going to be here, and I was excited that he's going to be here. And oh, cool. Yeah, Richard, uh, we, we haven't talked in a long time. Uh, I've just been so busy lately, and school has just been driving me insane. But, you know, we'll catch up <laughs> hopefully sometime soon. Yeah. Yeah. What, what grade do you teach in school? I teach eighth grade science. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. My... Uh, my kids sometimes say to me, you should be a biology teacher. That'd be so cool. So I, that's, that's pretty awesome that you're yeah. teaching science. Well, I don't know about education right now. It's not, <laughs> it's not all it's cracked up to be anymore. It seems like but there's some, yeah, difficulties. It's, been, it's been some wild times this year. Totally understandable. Oh, here's arthropod ambassadors. Oh, Hey, how you doing? Set up some magic potion ice buds with giant cave roach and a big setup. Both should be well fed. Not sure concerned with such a size difference. Yeah, yeah. As long as they're getting plenty of resources. That's usually when things start competing is when the resources are limited. So 
And I think that's exactly the case right there. You know, you want to make sure that everybody's well fed and usually they can like, coexist, but once things get out of balance and you <laughs> deny them what they need, then that's when they start looking toward each other. Yep, yeah, exactly right. So Dan has a question. You have a crested gecko and you said you'd do isopods with them. Which species, I don't know if you mentioned which species you keep with them. Um, well, I don't have them in my in my crested gecko enclosure right now, but mm. my daughter, um, she has a uh, a cat gecko. Is that what it's called? I oh, think cat it's cat gecko. A, okay. Yeah, and uh, she has some. Um, she has Armadillidium klugii in there with hers. I okay. gave her some. Yeah, the clown isopods, and mm -hmm. she likes them. They're cute, and uh, they do seem to be doing well in there because it's very moist, and they have plenty of room to roam around and lots of food to eat. Oh, yeah. Oh, we got a couple of others. Uh, so Armadillion clue guy with the, the cat gecko. I have uh, both dwarf whites and what do I have? Um, actually, dairy cows with another crested gecko and they seem to be doing fine. They've been doing well for about yeah. two, year, two years. And my daughter's poison dart frog uh, cage, she has, uh, she has um, klugii also in there. Okay. Yeah. And I have klugii with my garter snakes and it works perfectly. I oh, I saw you, the picture of your garter snakes. They're beautiful. Yeah. They, I love them. I'm so glad they're out of brumation. I missed them. <laughs> yeah. You're on the West coast or? I'm closer to the West coast. Closer yeah. to the West Coast, because I noticed yours are red. Yeah. The ones, the ones we have here are blue. Yeah. Yeah. The ones um, the, the ones that I have are actually from Montana. Oh, okay. The Montana locality. And so they have the red markings. Not all of that subspecies has the red markings, but some populations of them do. And so I was able to get some that have more of the red markings. And then Dope Critters has a super chat. Are there any tarantulas that specialize or benefit from my spot feeders? Okay. I've heard of people feeding... I spots to tarantulas. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, um, I don't know if I would use them as feeders. Um, maybe individually, like you drop in an, an isopod. But yeah, I wouldn't keep any isopods with spiderlings just because I would worry about them overtaking them because they are a little bit more sensitive. Um, so yeah, I would not keep any isopods with any spiderlings at all. So. I don't know. I don't usually use isopods for feeders at all, just because they're mostly pets for me. I, I just keep them as pets. So yeah. to me, feeding them off would be, <laughs> contra you know, contradictory to what I'm trying to do with them is breed them and, and, you know, get more, more of the varieties and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I see what you're saying. That makes sense. So Mr. Severelia sent a super chat too. Love all the tarantula YouTubers, Cat Richard, Petco, Dave, Alex. We don't even have any teas. If we did, Grandma Stola Pulchra and Pocillotheria Metallica. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, and we get a lot of people like that that don't have any teas. Uh, a lot of them are fascinated by them, and they kind of enjoy them vicariously through us, which is great. Mm -hmm. But they eventually get into them <laughs> because of us, <laughs> which I yeah. think is great. And, and I think it's awesome that we have so many YouTubers, so many talented people out there with a lot of great knowledge. Yeah, yeah, and I, I'm kind of in the same boat because I can't keep tarantulas, but I really enjoy the channels and the information and hoping that someday I'll get a facility that's not connected to my house and I can I get <laughs> some tarantulas. Yeah. Are you are you outgrowing your space? I Yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah. Definitely outgrowing same here. space. So Arthropod Ambassador says her Balfouri communal has a very strong colony of dwarf purple that do a great job cleaning out after them with no issues. Interesting. It kind of makes sense that another dwarf species would, would be able to do that. And ah, dwarf purple. Yeah. Have you oh. ever kept dwarf purples, Alex? I do not. I don't have any. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to yeah. get some. Great point, Arth Arthropod Ambassadors. Yeah. Let's see. I'm trying to keep up with all the chat. There's a lot of good chat yeah. today. Let's see. Oh, um, oh, Tarantula Cat had a comment. And yes, that's Dicera crocata. At least the genus is Dicera. I think if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Dicera, Dicera, something like that. And the crocata is one of the species, and there's another species that shows up once in a while. And they are from Europe, this spider that eats the roly-polies and um, specializes in eating 
uh, armadillidium especially, isopods. And uh, they are naturalized here. So you can see them. I go out in my backyard and find them all the time. So yeah, great, great point. There's, there are some spiders that are specialized for eating. Um, oh, that's really cool. I did not know things. that. Yeah, I have, um, I, years ago, I wrote a little ebook about, about isopods and I took pictures of a, one of these spiders actually holding a roly poly in its chelicerae. It can, when it was rolled up, it can actually, it's specialized to be able to grip them. When the when the roly polies rolled up and eat them and everything just like that, so they're pretty cool. Oh, this is a great question from Arthropod Ambassadors too. Do you have any stories about kids in your class becoming more interested or less afraid of bugs? Um, yeah, and uh, it's every year. I usually will have some breakthroughs. I do have a lot of students that are deathly afraid of spiders and even snakes. When I had the snakes. And it seems like they tend to come around. Some of them will become uh, more tolerant just because they're around them. And uh, others will actually go to the point of handling and, you know, breaking their fears to the point where they're no longer afraid. And then they want me to bring more in and so on. Uh, this year, because of the smaller room, I, I don't keep any at school. So what I've been doing is I kind of throughout the week, I plan my week to where Friday is usually a test day and we have a little bit of time after the test. So I will try to bring in a spider for show and tell. And now it's to the point where the kids get disappointed when I don't bring one in because <laughs> they always want to see something new. And yeah. I mean, I kind of have enough that I could bring a different one every week. So uh, it's, it's pretty neat for them to see that and, and experience that. But as far as one that sticks out, I do have a student that she's an adult now and uh, she ended up getting into breeding um, ball pythons and bearded dragons, and she blames me. So, <laughs> huh? awesome. Oops, I just dropped my earbud. Hold on. Uh oh. Oh well, he's fixing that. Dan has a question about the ebook. Um, let's see. That's not the question. I was sorry, folks. Dan was asking if the ebook. Sorry is still about available. that. <laughs> no problem. It is. It's on Amazon. If you look up Aquarimax on Amazon, there's a couple of ebooks there. They're both kind of old, but the information still works. I mean, you can raise isopods very well with the information I gave. I have changed my husbandry quite a bit since then, but it still works. So just with that disclaimer, the book is available. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. As Richard was saying, tarantula show and tell. Brilliant. <laughs> I love it. How many, how many species do you have um, that you can, you know, if you you can bring one every oh, week? Oh gosh, you know, out. I <laughs> I couldn't tell you that because I have not. I've been really lagging as far as cataloging everything that I have. Mm -hmm. um, I know I have probably well over 150 different tarantulas, uh, mm -hmm. individuals, but fewer than that as far as um, individual species. I, I do have doubles of, of some and sometimes even more than that. So I have several mm -hmm. pokies and uh, other ones, of course. So, <laughs> yeah, I definitely that's definitely something I need to do so that I have an actual count of everything and what I have. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I've just been falling behind on that. Well, how do you how do you keep track of which ones you've already brought? Do you have a list and like cross it off? I brought this one. I brought this one. To I'm class. sorry. How do I keep track of what? Of, of which ones you've brought to class already that year and which ones you haven't? Oh, um, I don't know. I just keep it in my head. So I just try to remember which ones I brought. And I, I try to I try to limit it to things that are not too venomous, I guess. So mm -hmm. I, I will bring in some species that are handleable or at least tolerate handling very well. Mm -hmm. And I will allow them to handle under close supervision so they really get a kick out of that. Um, I do bring some venomous species. In fact, I brought an HMAC last week, um, mm -hmm. last Friday. But, you know, it's funny. I have the uh, the cobweb castle, The um, yeah. if you recall that. Yeah. Um, it's become a good show and tell for the venomous species because I, I put... Here, I'll bring it out. The spider keep, that's what it is. Yeah. So what I've done is I've blocked off the hole right here. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then I put screws up here so that they can't open them, but they can view the tarantula in there and get a look at them. So 
they get a kick out of seeing him. And of course, you know, they, they know that they're very venomous, so they can only yeah. see him through the glass. So. Okay. So another, you repurposed the cobweb castle. I'm sorry? You repurposed the cobweb castle. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It seems like a good way to go. So you have the screws in there, and then you can just unscrew it when you are going to put that. Yeah, that and, back. you know, I screw it. I hand tighten it just enough to where they can't really easily get it out, and uh, I'll, I'll lock the tarantula in there. And, of course, they'll just be able to look at it and won't mess with them. Oh, yeah, that's genius. I love that. Here's a question from Tennyson about your experience with baboons and our Hapalopus species, Columbia. Oh, yeah. Um, I have several baboons. Um, in fact, one of my favorite ones is the Harpactera pulchropes, which is the golden blue leg baboon. Mm -hmm. On my last video, I had a very bad experience with that one. I tried to be breed her, I paired her, and she ate the male. Oh. Uh, there was a whole lot of warning signs there that I just kind of overlooked, and it turned out pretty bad. But... Um, Memories of a Violet, she has a mail that she's sending me. So um, hopefully I'll get a second chance with that. Awesome. Yeah, hopefully that works out. Uh, Hapalopus species Columbia. That is the uh, pumpkin patch, right? Yeah. And I have a couple of those. Um, great spiders, hardy. And uh, I really love them. I love the colors, but they're pretty easy to keep as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Oh, yeah. So Cobweb Castle, since you were showing that, they reached out and offered the new PDX Insectarium a set up for free. Oh, yeah. You know, um, Elliot sent me one, too. And um, the the Cobweb Castle. And at the time, I didn't get a spider in it. But when I was talking to my wife about it, and uh, I ended up getting a spider for it. So it's pretty cool. So I'm also, excited, too. He's uh, making a new one? I think it's... Um, I don't, I think it's the same, um, one. This is just talking about the new PDX insectarium, which is, oh. uh, that one's in Oregon, I think. Am I right, Arthropod Ambassadors, or did I mess that up? Very cool. Um, let's see. Okay. How about strange pets? Since you have Cresties, Alex, you can chime in on this one. If I had a crusty for a bit more than two weeks, has only pooped one between one and five times, should I be worried? Uh, two weeks, nah, I wouldn't be worried. As long as it is pooping, then you should be good. They, uh, I don't know, mine seems to eat kind of sporadically. There's times when it eats very well and then times when it just kind of chills out. But um, yeah, I guess it comes and goes because there's times when they don't really make a, that much of a mess. And then there's times when it's all over the glass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's a good point. If it's if just it, one, then it's the tank stays pretty clean if it's just one. Well, it's when yeah. you start having pairs and, yeah, then you start ending up with a lot of mess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, yeah, Arthur Rod and Pastor said that was Portland, Oregon. I was thinking PDX was. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what that was talking about. So, yeah, it's a very cool setup. I really like it. The It works just as you can tell that Elliot put a lot of thought into making the Cobweb Castle. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still enjoying it, even though I'm not using it for what it was, you know, intended for. But it still works for that. You know, just block off the hole and put in a tarantula, and it makes a great carrier. I take it to school. The kids get to enjoy the spider. It's out on display. It's not hiding anywhere. So yeah. then I just bring it right back home and put it back in its enclosure. So it's a pretty good tote for bringing it to, for show and tell. Yeah, I like that. And I'm I'm excited to use the, the Cobweb Castle for the uh, when I do you know educational presentations because it's so easy you you guaranteed you're gonna see the spider yeah yeah you can you can if flip it around you can even if it decides to be shy and not come out to eat or whatever. And still flip it around and show the little. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest disappointments. Like even at a zoo, you know, you have an enclosure that's set up appropriately for the spider. The spider's going to be hiding, and you never get to see it unless you go in there when it's dark or whatever. But yeah, uh, when you have something like that for just a temporary thing, show and tell, you bring it, they see it, they get to enjoy it, and then you take it right back home. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love that. So Tennyson has another question about a baboon. 
which would be a first baboon tarantula species? I always say the Harpectera pulchrapes. Um, it's just a beautiful tarantula. You got the golden color, the blue legs. That that's that chalky powder blue. That the coloration that they have is just to me really striking. Um, they're kind of a laid back baboon. I would not recommend an OVT, of course, an orange baboon tarantula. Um, mm -hmm. They're very high strung. Um, I haven't really had any major concerns or, or anything bad that I've dealt with as far as OVTs. I was always afraid to get into them because I heard the horror stories and everything. But as long as they're kept appropriately, they have an appropriate hide. Most of the time, they'll just retreat right into their hide and you really don't have to worry about them trying to bite you or give you a threat posture or anything like that. Usually it's when you don't have enough space for them and they're forced to kind of sit out on their webs and they don't have a place to retreat is when you're going to see all the feistiness out of them. And of course, when you're having to rehouse and so on, that's, you know, when you're going to see their attitude. But for the most part, they're very easy to keep and uh, you, you don't see them a whole lot except when they start to mature and they spend a whole lot of time out on their web. But every time you try to pop that lid, right into their hole. <laughs> oh, we've got a lot of a lot of great comments here. We've got a uh, tarantula cat. I wish I had a crestie that would pick a spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, yeah. we have the joke at my house that our crestie picks my wife. She takes the crestie out because our first oh. crestie actually belongs to her. And then it'll go to the bathroom. Like, almost and then he the gets bathroom. her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah, mine just goes all over the place. I think he prefers one wall, but no, he just goes all over sometimes. Well, we've got this super chat here, Mr. and Mrs. Morelia. What New World teeth are least likely to kick hairs? New World just seem like walking cacti bombs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that is a big issue with the, the New Worlds. Um, as far as least kicking hairs, I have not had a whole lot from Gramostola pulchropes, which is the, the um, Chaco Golden Knee. Mm -hmm. um, I have not seen a ton out of the Gramostola pulchra, and those are the uh, Brazilian black. Um, those seem to be very laid back as far as kicking hairs and things like that. I don't see a whole lot of that. Doesn't mean that they won't. They do here and there if they get startled. But for the most part, I don't see tons and tons of it. Um, those are the first two that come to mind. I'm sure there are others out there. But yeah, there are some that are just insane and they will kick a whole bunch of hair. Definitely stay away from the Nandu species because they will kick a whole mess of hair and they are very bad. Um, yeah, Salmon Pink, Lasiador Parhibana, bad hair kickers. <laughs> This is this is probably the the thing that I would be concerned personally more more than anything else about keeping tarantulas or something like that. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and when you and, and it's it's kind of tough to stay away from it too because like when I'll be feeding, um, I'll have some. I'll pop the lid and I'll go to put the the cricket in or whatever, and they'll kick hairs, and I think that I'm not affected because they're down there and I'm up here and, you know, I didn't see any hairs or anything and I feel like it just stayed in the enclosure. But then later on, I'll start itching and sure enough, I'll know that, I'll, that I've been, you know, haired. Um, mm -hmm. They don't seem to affect me too bad. I usually take a nice hot shower and kind of scrub the area pretty good and it mm -hmm. goes away the next day. But some people have very, very bad reactions to it. Um, I've seen some people get really blistered up from them. Oh, so yeah. if you have a bad reaction, yeah, then, you know, I'd be very careful with them. Yeah, that doesn't sound like fun. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the, the recommendations on that and the, the anti-recommendations yes. as well. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. and Mrs. Morelia, thank you for the super chat. Great question. Okay. Arthropod ambassadors. Uh, let's see. Any comments on the Lacey Act Amendment to the American Competes Act? U.S. ARC is where I get my most info. That That is the best place to get the info, I think, on this topic. Um, yeah, and, and mentioning that, um, yeah, I I recently joined US ARC because of it, um, mm -hmm. and I was kind of of the belief, you know, it's it's just reptiles they're after and so on. So I didn't really concern myself with it too much, but now I know better, you know. And uh, it's they're kind of going after everything. So mm -hmm. 
it's it's important that if you are a keeper, if you keep any exotic, and, and that includes birds and any kind of invertebrates, lizards, snakes, etc., um, yeah. our our you know there our rights are being infringed upon right now, and and we could very well lose that, or at least make it very difficult to where we can keep those species. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so I haven't heard a lot of updates for a while now, like new information about it, but uh, we definitely need, if, if you haven't written your senators about it, saying that you oppose the Lacey Act and the American Competes Act, you should do that. But first go to usarc.org, check out their website, and the, specifically this topic on the website, they have a list of talking points you can read through to include in your letter. Make sure that it is a respectfully worded letter and coherently worded letter, that's going to convince them a lot more than a demonstration of anger. You don't want to be angry with, you don't want your senators to be the objects of your anger. You want them to be your advocates on this topic. So if you have not written anything yet, please do that. And then donate or even better join US ARC. And partly the difference between donating and uh, becoming a member is not only that of becoming a member is going to add up to more money over time to help them. It's also that uh, the membership counts. US Art can show we have this many members who are supporting us. And if they're talking to people and they can say, I have, you know, 2 million people or 5 million people, that's how it gets counted, not by the donations. So it's not just the money, it's that your voice is being counted more if you become a member. Those are a couple of points. And I know arthropod ambassadors, you know that, but for other people who may not know about it, um, there's some more information. Yeah, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought that up because that is definitely something that's been kind of weighing heavily on me because of course I have so many different tarantulas and so many species. And um, I worry if if the, they do come down and say that they are no longer allowed to be kept or anything like that, what am I gonna do? You know, and right. uh, I might move in the future and if I can't cross state lines with them then you know that means I've got to get rid of them and so on so there's a lot riding on it and I I, I wish that they'd caught it sooner um, and not pass the house yet but you know mm -hmm. we still got the Senate so we'll see if it if it gets thrown out and I'm hoping they do and yeah. definitely yeah support US ARC because they're our voice. They're the ones that will speak for us. They're the ones that will fight for us. And, uh, you know, I, I feel helpless because I'm just a person. I'm just an individual. But if you spread the word and, of course, if you join, you're part of that force. Yeah, exactly. Good, good points. And, you know, um, I, I got to give uh, Richard uh, a shout out for having made his video. That's how I found out about it from Richard's video, Tarantula Collective. And I started posting about it and I've had other YouTubers and other people say, and you're how I found out about it. And so it spreads, you know, spreading the words, another important uh, thing to do. Yeah, definitely. And I do have good news that my Senator wrote me back when both senators that I wrote to wrote me back, but one of them said, uh, I'm opposed to this bill. So woo. <laughs> I, I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Yeah, that is good news. Cause you know, I've been worried, wondering about it as far as like, um, this is income. This is people's livelihoods. You have a whole lot of people that are in the pet trade and they're affecting so many of them. So how can they just blatantly do something that's going to affect those people? That's, that's money. That's, that's money that's coming into the States that are doing this stuff, you know? So it's almost like shooting themselves in the foot. It's, it's, I almost feel like they, they don't really know what they're doing as far as that is concerned. Absolutely. Um, here in Florida, we've already lost several species that are now banned because of things that have gone on. Uh, of course, we have several invasive species living here, so mm -hmm. they automatically start targeting the exotics because of that. And I mean, we've got what Burmese pythons, and you've got a lot of monitors, a lot of your larger lizards, tegus. Uh, iguanas, all those things have just been taken off the tables. Um, we used to see them all at the reptile shows and even just recently. And of course, now they're not there anymore. So yeah. we only see some of the same things over and over. Your smaller species, you don't see a lot of those, those larger things. 
And I understand their viewpoint as far as trying to keep them out of the wild in Florida is so easy for them to establish. But, mm -hmm. you know, where does it end? Where, how far are they willing to go with this? Right. Because the, these laws would make it impossible for you to keep just because it might establish in Florida, which, yes, is a valid concern. It doesn't mean it's going to establish in Alaska or Michigan or Utah, you know, and so they need to keep that in mind. But they're, they're not. So. Let's see. <laughs> Our suggestion. Yeah, Richard knows the deal. <laughs> yeah, he's he's experienced eradicating hairs enough. <laughs> Let's see. All right. So, Javi Strange Pets wrote a letter. Excellent. I'm sure a lot of you have. Okay. okay. Got a lot of people. Here's a question from Alex to Alex. Do you guys know which species of tarantula and isopod are found in the wild in New Mexico, about an hour and a half from Juarez in a most desert terrain? Hmm. Um, uh, specifically, what species? I know that there are a Phanopelma species that live in New Mexico, but I can't tell you exactly which ones. I'm assuming um, uh, we're the most common ones, the Calcodes or... Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, gosh, like you know, Hensi, or uh, I don't really know. Uh, I'm not really that sure of their of their range, but mm -hmm. I do know that they are pretty spread out throughout the uh, the West. Yeah, that, that makes sense. The Ponopelmas. We even get a, a Ponopelma iodius up where I am mm -hmm. in yeah. northern Utah. They show up, which yeah. is kind of funny, but. The, There's so uh, many of Fauna Pelma. I, I yeah. did not realize that we had so many of them living in the United States. Yeah. I think that's the only species I get right around here in the southern part of my state. There's like six or seven different tarantula species, but here's we, we get one. And then uh, let's see. Isopod species in the actually in the desert terrain where you're from near Juarez. Um, I'm not sure if Venicillo um, Arizonicus makes it that far east or not. It might. It seems like that would be a decent habitat for it, but I, I can't tell you for sure. But Venicillo um, Arizonicus does exist in habitat, desert habitats in the southwest, so it's a possibility. Um, but I um, am not well versed in the you know different species of uh, tarantula in New Mexico for sure. Yeah, I'd have to look that up to get a specific tarantula species that would live there. And of course, my isopod experiences are not very, <laughs> not, I don't know that much about them. So I wouldn't know of any desert species that, <laughs> that live out there. Yeah. And there's a possibility, there's a species that appears to be Porcelia levis that shows up in the Southwest in some spots too, but very desert adapted, but I'm not sure if it would be out there. So Richard is saying the senators have responded multiple times. Every time I send an email, always a form letter response, nothing to do with the topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's not good news. <laughs> One of the senators that wrote me back, it was basically like that. It wasn't, it was very form lettery. But the other one was at least specifically responding to the bill and saying, yeah, this is a crummy bill. And here's a couple of reasons why I think it's crummy. So I was impressed by that one. But that that's not the norm that we're getting. But at least uh, we're being squeaky wheels. But you know, as long as we're being polite, squeaky wheels, then we're we're making a difference. Oh, here's a good one for you: Dream Tarantula for your collection from DEA. <laughs> Um, yeah, right now, you know, of course, it changes with us hobbyists. So once you have it, it's no longer a dream tarantula. So right now, I am oh, after the uh, Therophosa. Um, species Panama. And I, I think it's recently undergone a name change. I'm not really sure. Um, I think it's now Davis species pa Panama. Uh, I I'm, I'm, might be misspeaking here, but I think I saw something like that. Uh, the lava tarantula is what I guess the common name for it. Mm -hmm. I know Richard has one. I'm jealous of it. <laughs> is it called lava because of the patterning and the coloring? Yes, they're they are black with stripes on them, or they have black stripes on them, and um, just 
between the stripes, they have a brilliant red coloration. It's almost like a lava color. It's just beautiful. Oh, okay. So kind of like yeah. lava showing from between the cracks in the black rock sort of idea. Cool. I'm sorry, I missed that last one. Oh, I was just saying kind of like a lava shining through the black crack. The cracks yes, in the black Yeah, rock. like cracked lava. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So dope critters wants to know the average feeding cycles of tarantulas. I guess it depends on age and whatnot too, but yeah, it does depend on the age. Um, as far as feeding is concerned, I usually feed once a week. Not all the time. It depends on, on your tarantula, too. Um, if I have one that's looking especially plump and it looks like it might be going into pre-molt, then I'll hold off. And uh, I might wait a little bit and then try it again next time and see if it will eat. Um, but for the most part, I feed on a schedule once a week. My spiderlings, I tend to feed twice a week. But even with them, I tend to slack off once they get a little bit of size on them. So it's just easier for me to keep a schedule once a week. But definitely okay. with the spider links, a little bit more frequently just because they're growing pretty fast. Okay. Makes sense. So Kyle had a question. Kyle Scott had a question that I didn't get to earlier. I wanted to, but there's, there's just no way I can keep up with all the chat, of course. But it's uh, basically, are there communal species of tarantula that you've worked with? Yeah, there's quite a few, um, I guess, communal species, we can say. Um, there are several that tolerate each other. Um, a lot of people will keep Bacillotheria species together. Um, if they're sac mates, they tend to be very, they tend to do very well. But I keep hearing kind of the same thing over and over that they'll tolerate each other to a certain point. Usually about a year, year and a half, you might start seeing some cannibalism. Um, and, um, some people report that they usually will end up with a single fat spider. Um, but I, I started out with a, uh, I had a, a Pacillotheria rufolata communal that I got from fear, fear not tarantulas. And, um, I kept them for about a year and I started hearing things about that and I ended up separating them. So they're doing very well on their own, but, you know, they, they never bothered each other the entire time that, that I kept them, but I just worried that they would eventually kill each other off. Um, and, you know, there are some that are considered truly con communal. I think Neoholotheli Inse and uh, those, I think it's a Trinidad Olive. Some people keep those communally. I've seen success and I've seen, you know, not so successful. I think Richard is keeping a colony that he was given. So uh, we'll see mm -hmm. how his does. Um, I hear more on the side of not doing so well where there is some cannibalism, but that could just be attributed to maybe not feeding as frequently and not feeding well enough. Mm -hmm. um, I have a communal of uh, Monocentropus balfouri, which are the Socotra Island blue baboons. And I've had those for going on four years now. I have six of them and they're all doing well. And fortunately, I, I, I don't know what I did, but I got six females. So they're all doing well. Um, I have a friend that is sending me a couple of males, so hopefully I'll be breeding here in the near future. Now, that's a small communal, six of them. I would recommend anywhere five or or above to keep the, that species. Um, a good number for me, I think, would be about 10 tarantulas of that species. Uh, I know some guys in England, uh, Jaden, or is it uh, Grin, Mr. Grindler's Creatures? I think he has a communal of over 100. Um, and wow. there's some other ones that are out there. Um, uh, Ian's tarantulas, I think he has over a hundred in his communal and I think that's great, but I always wonder how can you feed that many and know that you're doing well and know that they're all fine, you know, because right. you can't possibly count them inside their enclosures. So you just enjoy them. They're out all the time. You can see them quite frequently. Whereas mine, because my communal is so small, they don't come out as often. So I mm -hmm. have to wait feeding time. They'll come out and I get to enjoy them. But for the most part, they're hiding in their burrows. Wow. I, I've always been fascinated by communal anything. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. It yeah. It's just... And that's that's the main reason I got into the Balfouri because mm -hmm. They're, I, I consider them to be truly communal. Just the when you watch their interactions and the social behaviors that they that they have, 
to me, that tells me that they they may do this naturally. Um, when they're feeding, there are certain things that they do. They play keep away. Uh, one will grab and they'll chase and uh, try to get it because when they're smaller, they tend to feed together. But right. as they get older, then they tend to hoard the food and they'll grab it and they'll run. So some of them are still wanting to do the feeding together and they play a little keep away game and they run around <laughs> and kind of keep the food away from each other. And they'll even go so far as to kick and push back with their legs. So it's just fun <laughs> to watch. And yeah. uh, I think I would enjoy that more if I had more of them because yeah. then you could see more interaction. But right now, you know, I just get a few of them that come out and it might be two of them that are running around playing keep away, but they're yeah. fun. Yeah. They're fun to watch. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I would watch a video just watching a feeding of that species just to see that behavior. That'd be so cool. <laughs> so Memories of Violet sent a super chat. Thank you. Thanking you for your videos. Great info and for feeding. Oh, and, and thank, thank you. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Um, this is something that I love. It's a, my hobby and it's kind of relaxing for me coming into my room. This is where I work. So when I come home from school and I have to do all the schoolwork that I hate to do, <laughs> I'm in this room surrounded by tarantulas. So I've always got something that I could enjoy while I'm doing the stuff that I hate. But <laughs> I wish I could do this full time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Oh, and Richard has one uh, follow up. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, the documentary uh, bug out. Did they, the way they framed the invert hobby upset you as much as it did me. Have you seen that? Oh, I have not seen that, but that is going to be on my list to watch. Bug Out. I'll tell you what, this um, Bug Out contacted me months ago, months and months ago, maybe. I don't even know how long ago, a long time. They said, we want to use a clip for one of your YouTube videos. We're going to make a documentary about people who love bugs. And I said, oh, that sounds cool. Which clip do you want to use? And they told me and... Um, I said, okay, that sounds cool because you know it's about a, it's a documentary about people who love bugs. And then I saw the trailer and I was like, what? This oh. does not look like what I thought it was going to be at all. Uh, oh man! Uh, now now I got to watch it. And yeah, we'll have I to fuss about it. <laughs> I don't know if they ended up using the clip anyway. They may have, <laughs> maybe in there somewhere, but it's like only like a few seconds of a clip of me unboxing something. But. Uh, I, I was really frustrated when I saw the trailer. I'll say that. Wow. I, I, hate, I hate it when they do that, when they demonize it. Um, I think I saw something recently where it was a guy, I guess in the UK. They seem to do a lot of stories in the UK on stuff like that. But man sleeps with 150 tarantulas and they just kind of want to creep everybody out and paint us to be these people that are just weird and into strange stuff. And right. I guess... Maybe it is kind of strange to have so many tarantulas, but you know, I love them. It's it's just fun, <laughs> right? And but they they're looking for the drama and the the shock value, and and that's not what yeah, we're about, yeah. right? It's yeah. all entertainment. They yeah. don't care how they're painting the the hobby or anything like that. They just want to shock people into watching their stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so Richards. Uh, Holothelia insect communal doing very well. No cannibalism yet. Keep them well fed and set up like <laughs> Dr. Rayer suggested. That was a fantastic episode. I I love all the, the episodes, of course, but that episode was really fascinating when she was talking about the how she got the communal setups going. Really fun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm guessing that the people that have the horror stories about keeping them you don't know how well they're keeping them. Um, Cause you, you hear about Monocentropus Balfouri all the time too, uh, mm -hmm. that there's, you know, their communal crash and they have one left and so on, but you don't know how they're keeping it. Are they keeping it well? Are they feeding them enough and so on? Because I can tell you sometimes feeding gets to be a chore. And especially when you have a lot um, I was having a difficult time keeping up with some of my assassin bugs um, mm -hmm. just because they eat so much. And, you know, if you don't feed them well enough, then they're going to start eating each other. They have nothing left to eat. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, in the bug out, my face is not actually in the clip that they said they were going to use or that they were interested in using. It's just I'm doing an unboxing, so you see my hands unboxing some velvet ants, I think is what's Oh, going. wow. So if you see any large velvet ants in there, those are probably mine. 
<laughs> I think that's the clip they were going to use. They said they might use some other ones too, but we'll see. Oh, we got another super chat from Theropod Hunter. Spiro stepped at a species grown to our most recent invert. They're like pink like bumblebees the size of ivories and they have big red baboon butts. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting military. Big red baboon butts. You got me there. <laughs> got my interest. Yeah. Um, wow. I think of the Spirostreptids, the millipedes, there's some pretty fantastic stuff you can get in Europe that we can't get here. Yeah, I love all the stuff that I see from Europe because they get into anything. It's like there's a colorful fly or something and they have it and they keep it as pets. And it's just amazing to me all the different things that they keep. Yeah. Yeah, They it's, it's amazing that they can get so much and that it's fairly easy to uh, transport it from country to country and whatnot. So not not the same as the hobby over here. And it's kind of fun because we do things and have things. I have people contacting me from Europe saying, can you ship blue death fanny beetles to Europe? I would love some. And I say, well, no, I'm sorry, I can't. Um, yeah. So it's the grass is greener on the other side to some extent because we have things they don't and vice versa. Right, right. Yeah. And they're like, uh, I know the UK, they can't keep... Uh, certain scorpion species, the more venomous ones, of course, mm -hmm. you need uh, some kind of permit or something that's, of course, really expensive and prohibitive. So uh, they're always commenting whenever I show pictures of my scorpions or I have a video with a scorpion in it that's very venomous and they can't keep them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot that uh, I remember hearing about that in Italy. I think it is. I don't think they can even keep very many tarantulas. Yeah, it's just severely limited. Right. Um, here in Florida, um, I there are several roach species that I would love to get into just because they're so interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Madagascar hissing roaches, for example, I would love to keep those, but they're illegal here. We can't keep dubia roaches. We can't keep uh, the hissing roaches. And there's lots of other species that we can't keep. So mm -hmm. we're limited to pretty much indigenous or um I guess species that, that have been introduced and established already, like the uh, discoid roaches. The discoid, so that's that's the one I was thinking of. That in Florida, that's yeah. like the big feeder roach because it's uh, right. It's allowed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they they grow so much slower. It, you know, they 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 don't grow very fast, so they're kind of hard to establish. Mm -hmm. uh, I had my colonies; they they dwindled over the winter, and uh, so I've I've had to kind of lay off of them for a little bit so that I could get them back up and uh, mm -hmm. I've switched over to crickets. But um, I don't know. I seem to have some issues with crickets. I don't like crickets. They smell bad. And I, I ever since I started breeding or having crickets, not breeding them, but bringing in crickets, I seem mm -hmm. to be getting some um, of the, the scuttle flies, the forward flies. Oh, uh -huh. I, I've, I've been getting some of those in here and they're just a pain in the butt. Yeah, crickets definitely have a lot of downsides. And as far as feeders go, if I could switch over to roaches, I probably would. But that's another creature I'm not allowed to keep. But <laughs> the, uh, the 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 good side of that is I'm allowed to keep anything bes besides hot species of anything, um, tarantulas and roaches. So I, I've got it pretty good. <laughs> but that's the wife list, or is that the... <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, and I can respect that. I mean... You got to keep her happy too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'd yeah. rather have her happy. Than I, I went against my wife's wishes, and uh, when I first got my tarantula, she she told me absolutely not. You can take that back to the store, and I had to <laughs> convince her, and uh, she finally relented. And you know, she understood that they weren't as bad as what she thought they were. Mm -hmm. She would still flinch every time she'd see it when she walked by. It would be a you know that reaction that she would get, but I guess over time she desensitized herself mm -hmm. and it got to the point where she actually kept one in her library. And yeah, cool. um, then the kids started getting them and it kind of grew from there. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, and thank you to, uh, to Richard for joining us, joining us tonight. He has to go, but appreciate that 100 K in 2022 would love that good to see so. you richard good to talk to you at least <laughs> yeah yeah great to have you here let's see 
So have you ever kept the, the dwarf wood scorpions? There, pot hundreds um, I have not. Um, you know, what's kind of weird is when the kids, when they were younger, we used to go out in the woods and uh, my boys used to play airsoft. So I'd go out there and do some airsoft with them. And uh, we'd make like forts out of just logs and things that we would find. <laughs> and every now and then we'd get stung by a scorpion or something. But um I think it was my daughter that found one of those little dwarf. Um, it didn't have a tail as a tail is scorpion. Oh, a pseudo little... scorpion. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. 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 So we, we were fascinated by those, but I just never kept them because they were, you know, they're just natural. We just leave them out there, but they're fun to watch. They're, they're so tiny. Yeah. I have a colony of those from uh, Arizona that oh, wow. um, I got from Kyle at Roach Crossing. And they've been breeding. We've got generations of them. They're pretty cool. They just, <laughs> in a 32 ounce deli cup, you can have a whole colony of dozens yeah. and dozens of them. So they're pretty cool. Oh, <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I, ne I never thought to keep those. If it's too small, if it's real small, I don't, I don't really want to keep them just because I don't like dealing with little food like that. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. They, they are a little bigger than some other pseudoscorpions, a little larger, but still very tiny. Yeah. Oh, fruit fly cultures. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's, of course, the small species of roach that you can use. But as far as like having large quantities like fruit flies and breeding as fast as fruit flies do, I don't really know of a good substitute for that. Right. It, because they breed so fast. But another species, I think the, the small roach species like the nymphs or you do like a Kenyan roach or something like that you can get some small ones but like you said they're not going to be as prolific another one that's good is the uh confused flower beetle larvae they're along the same lines is about the same size and i know a lot of people will use them as an alternative to fruit flies for small critters like um young tarantulas eat the larvae they, nothing really eats the adults or very few things eat the adults but are they are they prolific they're fairly prolific i wouldn't say as fast as fruit flies, but, you know, because in good weather, when, you know, decent temperatures, mid 70s to 80 or so, you can get, uh, you know, your fruit flies in two weeks can be totally booming from a new culture. This is not the case with the flower beetles, but you can, in six weeks, you can have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them. So they're yeah. fairly prolific. And if, as long as you're just, you know, every month or two, you start a new culture, maybe every six weeks, start a new culture, then you can have as many as you need. Wow. Um, Harvesting them is a pain in the butt. And I know people say fruit flies are hard to harvest. <laughs> uh, the problem with these larvae, I, I should say the larvae are not particularly difficult to harvest. The difficulty is separating the adults from the larvae because you can only oh, feed yeah. off the larvae because the adults are, they taste bad. Nothing eats them. So separating them is the more difficult part. But uh, I just use a, a sieve to you know scoop them up out of the substrate, which is basically mixed kinds of flour and I'll mix other things like spirulina and whatnot in there. You sieve them up, and then you've got this huge pile of larvae and adults, and you have to like put them in a, a shallow container or something, let all the adults crawl out after an hour or so, and then you can collect the larvae. That's one way to do it. Um, but anyway, they're, they're a pretty good, pretty solid alternative. Not that, you know, I raise fruit flies, and I'm not going to stop because I need them. They're, they're things I raise, kind of a lot of things that I keep that eat fruit flies, but that's another, at least a, partial alternative you can vary the diet and it's a, a, a fallback if you run out of fruit flies that kind of thing yeah and and could it also um be the the media that you use as far as what you what the fruit flies are breeding in um what do you use russ i make my own medium and the base i can just tell i don't mind telling folks what i use the base is just cheap potato flakes and then I add nutritional yeast, which I buy at bulk at the grocery store. And I'll usually add some, uh, a little bit of like rapashi um, super pig for some natural colorants. So whatever, you know, the fruit, whatever the fruit flies eats, getting some of that. And I'll, I use methyl paraben powder, which I buy from Josh's frogs to uh, fight off the mold. And then I put either uh, brown sugar and molasses or just one of those two or both of them in as kind of a, a base uh, as well, just like a tablespoon or so of that in every time I make a culture. Works really well and it's cheap. That's the reason why I use it because it's a lot cheaper than other medium. But um, because of the 
the nutrients and the molasses and the nutritional yeast and the, the super pig and so on. It's pretty well balanced. I get great results. Yeah, I, I make my own fruit fly culture as well, or fruit fly, fruit fly media, and I use the potato flake. Um, I don't put as much in it as you do, but I do put um, cinnamon, I guess, over the top of it just mm -hmm. to kind of cut down on the on any kind of mold or anything like that. But it also, to me, it seems to keep the smell down. It doesn't smell as mm -hmm. bad as some of the other media that I've, that I've used before. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other medias tends to smell real bad fast. And this yeah. doesn't seem to. It just kind of has a, a slight vinegary, cinnamony smell, <laughs> which mm -hmm. I'm not really a fan of vinegar smell, but the cinnamon kind of covers that up. Yeah. And I've used... I, I use that same uh, method using the cinnamon and the vinegar to fight the mold for years. And then I just switched to methylparaben because it is a little bit easier. And yeah, um, yeah, basically it's just easier. And so I use that, but that's a very effective method too. Cool. i would have to get your recipe just to try it out. Oh yeah. And with yeah, my totally. daughter and her and her dart frogs, we, you know, we kind of have to keep fruit flies on hand. Fruit flies on hand. Exactly. So yeah, I'd be happy to, share it to y'all. Um, I'll let you know what I use and be happy to do that. So banded crickets. Yeah. Mr. and Mr. Merrily banded crickets. I like those. I've raised both just house crickets and banded crickets both. And they're, I think all, all in all, I prefer banded crickets because they chirp much more quietly. They're easier to raise. They're less cannibalistic. They're less smelly. They're less likely to die. They're just hardier. <laughs> um, but they're a little smaller, which can be a problem depending on what you're feeding. They hop a lot uh, better. They're more athletic. Jumping. Yeah, they they, they hop pretty high. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if I'm going to do crickets again, right now I'm just buying crickets. I raised them for years and years and kind of got sick of it and needed more space. And so I just now I'm buying crickets again. But if I do raise crickets, they will be banded crickets and I'll do it in a bioactive setup because the bioactive setups, if done right, don't smell that much. So... They're they're much less smelly than a non bioactive setup for crickets. You just you have to do it the right way. And let's see. Oh, there's so many. I'm I kind of missed some chat there. I'm trying to catch yeah. up. Can't do all of it. So, do you have any other feeders that you use besides crickets and stuff for your? Uh, um. Primarily is discoid roaches, and mm -hmm. uh, I needed a substitute for um, red runners because I do, you know, have the small slings that I have to feed. So um, I kind of looked around to see what they have as far as uh, um, Florida legal roaches, and one of the ones that I discovered are pallid roaches, and mm -hmm. I keep a colony of those. Um, their their nymphs are really small, just like um, just like red runners. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're as fast as Red Runners, but they seem to do the trick. So that's kind of where, where I've gone with as far as my smaller feeders for my spiderlings and, and uh, juvenile tarantulas. Mm -hmm. um, they are pretty prolific. I did have a problem. They came with uh, buffalo beetles. Mm -hmm. And uh, it got to the point where the buffalo beetles were, were outnumbering the roaches and I was noticing I had all adults and no nymphs. So I was assuming that the buffalo beetles were helping themselves to the nymphs. So once I removed the buffalo beetles, my colonies went back to normal. So maybe oh. I just wasn't feeding enough or um, I don't know, but it, it was a problem. <laughs> yeah, that, those I had some of those buffalo beetles too. And I originally got them. They were sold to me as a different species. Hmm. And they were sold to me as Tenebrio um, Obscurus, the dark mealworm. And uh -huh. I found out they were actually the buffalo worms, the Alpha Tobias diaparinus. And part of the reason I wanted to raise them is for my chickens. And I found out that buffalo beetles are actually bad for chickens. So, oh, gosh. So I stopped raising them. They can, <laughs> they can cause like uh, digestive issues with chickens. And so, yeah. Let's see. Um, here's a question Which piece of cricket is used for edible insect operations? I think in most cases that is um, Aceta domestica, just the, the house cricket, the common one sold in pet stores that's not the banded cricket. I think so. Pretty sure it is. Cool. 
<laughs> I've never eaten crickets. I I have tasted crickets a few times, a couple yeah. different species. There's a different species. It's more of a, I guess it's a grasshopper they eat in Mexico that they call chapulines. Chapulines, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I've I've had those, and I've also had uh, normal house crickets. Um, but yeah, I'd like I'd like to try some. I might do a live stream or something and uh, try some on, <laughs> yeah, on screen and see. Um, because I, I keep seeing, you know, where they have a whole bunch of different types of edible insects and stuff. And mm -hmm. I hear some of them are actually pretty good. So I want to yeah. try some out. Mealworms and crickets and chapulinas, grasshoppers. Yeah. The, the Other cultures eat were... tarantulas and scorpions and so on. That's true. The chapulinas <laughs> were kind of actually pretty good. They had like a chili lime yeah. flavoring on them and they weren't bad. Um, yeah, I guess you flavor it up enough, it'll taste pretty good after a while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and the, the mealworms I had were pretty good too. They're kind of buttery. It was pretty good. So, oh, the lights behind me, um, those are just puck lights that I bought off of Amazon. Um, they're just multicolored puck lights. You can, they got a little remote and I can change the color and, and the intensity do all kinds of and, stuff with them. That's pretty cool. And they're just all yeah. in a, wired in an array so that you can control yeah they're fairly features. inexpensive um i actually saw them on richard's i got them off of richard's uh, list because he always posts stuff that he buys on amazon and uh i know he has them on his page somewhere but um yeah they're they're not too expensive i think for the the eight set i think they have eight lights is somewhere around 30 40 dollars something like that so not mm. too too bad yeah that's really pretty pretty reasonable well, I uh, I looked at the clock and realized, wow, we we actually have already done our hour and, and a little <laughs> little bit more. So that's good because it means the the chat's been rolling. We've been talking about funny things, but I I know I I only I told Alex that we'd try to wrap up close to an hour. So um, we probably should wrap up. Uh, is there anything else um, you want to uh, uh, tell everyone about Alex? Where can they find you? That's one thing. I mean, I've got the YouTube stream right under here in the banner, but um, anything where else they should find you? Yeah, um, of course, I've got my YouTube channel. Some of you guys already know me from that, Tarantula Haven. Um, I'm also on TikTok, uh, Tarantula Haven Official, because somebody got Tarantula Haven, so <laughs> mm -hmm. I wasn't able to get that. And uh, I do have Tarantula underscore Haven, which is on Instagram as well. So I post pictures there. I used to post a lot more frequently than I have been lately. Um, same thing with the TikToks. I haven't been posting videos there lately. And I do want to, you know, let everybody know right now, those of you that know me and, and have been following me, um, I have been really struggling to keep up with everything because of work. And, you know, it's one of those things where because I've been put into a subject that I was not teaching before, I'm having to come up with new curriculum and things like that. So it's constantly taking my time. So mm -hmm. I've really struggled to find time for my channel. It's really killing me. And, uh, you know, as soon as I, I am able to either move away from that or um, after the year is over, I should get back to normal because once I do it once, you know, like the whole year, then it becomes rinse and repeat. So I can do it again the next year and I've already got it laid out. So, you know, it's just one of those things where I'm really, really having a hard time keeping up, but it should clear up. So bear with me. <laughs> I yeah. apologize for not posting frequently. And, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll come back. I'm not, I'm not quitting at least not yet, but I, I still love my tarantulas and I still plan on keeping them regardless of what happens. So this is a passion of mine and I'd really like to continue doing it. Yep. And sometimes it's, it can be hard to keep up with everything, all the demands of life, but, uh, yeah, definitely wish you the best. And we're glad that you joined yes, us. Sir. Thank you. Mantis God sends some overtime pay for you there. <laughs> yeah, overtime pay. <laughs> Thank you, Mantis God. All right, yeah, well, you know, that's, that's the joys of teaching. It's like you take your work home with you. You're not getting paid for it. We're on a salary. But um, it, it, the work's not going to get done if I don't spend the extra time doing it. So I just, it's something I have to do. And, uh, you know, because... I was placed into science, which I was not teaching before. I had mm -hmm. taught it before a few years ago. I left it because it was killing me that these kids don't want to learn science. And uh, yeah. I, I struggle, you know, holding their attention and getting them to enjoy it as much as I do. So it was breaking my heart. So I went back to what I was doing, which was technology and photography. 
And mm -hmm. I loved that because I could do that with my eyes closed and it gave me plenty of time to work on my videos and things like that. Yeah. But we switched schools. It, I was placed back in science. So I, I was forced to go back into that area and whole new book, whole new curriculum. And of yeah. course, I have to supplement everything with enrichment activities and labs and things like that. So it really does take a lot of time to, to keep up with it. Oh, that's totally understandable. Yeah. And public school teachers are not appreciated enough. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but I can I can say that for sure. Having been in uh, various educational capacities. Uh, yeah, they, they don't get enough of the no, deserve everything all the best for sure thank you and and thank you so much alex for joining us and thank you everyone thank you for all all the support uh just joining us tonight and for the super chats and everything for the great questions we appreciate it everybody and thank we'll you, you thank you for having me i appreciate the opportunity thank you